so, so this session now is uh, intended, well, we, we have set up for our foundations program, so all of our new faculty um, here. So I hope that your, your first semester has been successful so far. You made it up through midterms. Um, all of you are still awake, and it's after lunch, so I think you must be doing really well. Uh, all right, um, a couple things. We have a, a quick announcement on the ETE 10. If you recall, um, if you were able to make it to the um, conference we had in August, we had put together the badging program, which we're now, now calling the Empowering Teaching Excellence 10. And that's a way that you can, to help you document uh, some of the activities that you're doing uh, towards to improve your teaching. So this event here is one of those things that you could document as, um, as something that you are doing towards your teaching through this badging program. Now on December 1st, we are going to release the, the website that is available that you can sign up um, to, to start documenting your teaching and receiving these badges. And um, that will, can be found at empoweringteaching.usu.edu. Okay, so if you go to empoweringteaching.usu.edu, you can log in there, sign up, enter your application, and then you can start to submit evidence of, um, of some of the, the attendance of different uh, programs like these that you go to. And, um, and then also, uh, and that would be at, at the engaged level, you can also get an implementation badge to go with that of what you may learn from uh, some of these programs. You go ahead and document that and show evidence of it. You can put that in there. Now this will be tracked and this will follow you throughout your career. Um, the program we're also using ties into LinkedIn and we'll, we'll make sure that that ties in with any other uh, respective programs to help you in, in throughout that process of documenting your teaching. So if you have questions about that, you can also grab one of these cards and or contact us over at AIS and we can assist you with that. Now, uh, another thing to put on your calendar on December 1st, um, coincidentally, uh, we have a pre another presentation that we're going to be putting on, and that is um, uh, one focused on working with student veterans. And um, so we do have a, a fair amount of our population of our students that are veterans, and, um, and the objective for this is um, to help give you an overview of difficulties fa facing student veterans including the readjustment after deployment and coming to campus. Uh, the presentation will review the community and VA resources available to veterans and will provide tips for college and university fa faculty and staff for working effectively with these veterans. So we have Aaron Ahern uh, coming up from the Salt Lake uh, City VA Hospital that will be providing this um, presentation. And so there, I think there'll be cards like these that will be sent out, and you'll see those in your inbox that will be reminding you about that, but it's you know, just after the holidays. So on December 1st, that will be available over in the Distance Education Building. Um, now lastly, uh, I'd, I would like to, to kind of address our presentation today. Um, for many of you, uh, academic and instructional service, uh, you know us as the tech guys. I mean, we're the ones that are out promoting technology. We have been more or less typecast as the, the techni technical support to help you with your teaching, which we do. We, we facilitate these classrooms. We provide you training and access to any of the educational technologies. Now, we try to find balance, or we believe that there, there needs to be a balance in, in what we promote. And so if you recall, um, earlier this year, we invited a, a speaker, Dan Chambliss, that came and um, emphasized the importance of relationships. So I think, if I recall, he, what he was emphasizing is the need to, to invite students into your home, get to know them, create a relationship with them, and that will help them persist and graduate and be more successful. He also recommended that we put the students together in, in, um, in the old-style dorms where they had to share spaces and where they would be um, interacting with 20 or more different individuals each, each day, and that would potentially result in two to three uh, friends that they would have or other individuals that had relationships. So those are definitely not technology related, yet they um, show great, have, have shown to have success, academic success for the students. So today, 
we have invited um, President Jose uh, uh, Bowen, who is president of Goucher, Goucher College. Um, he has, is a fascinating individual. We, uh, Neil and I were able to drive up from the airport and uh, we, we get to learn a lot about his musical career. Um, so he has, uh, has been, it was dean of the Meadows School of the Arts down at Southern Methodist University, um, has received teaching awards at Stanford, Georgetown, and Miami. Um, he's very well published, has uh, written over 100 scholarly articles and edited the Cambridge Companion to Conducting in 2003. And um, is an, in 2011 was an editor of a six CD set of the jazz for the, the Smithsonian Anth Anthology. And um, has appeared as a musician. Um, I think he told us the one, one year he performed over 300 times. So he's well traveled and very busy with his uh, musical career at one time. Um, has uh, presented with Stan Gatz, Bobby McFerrin, and others. Um, he's written a symphony nominated, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, uh, which is music for Hubert Laws and Jerry Garcia. Now, today we have invited him to, um, to talk about the book that he has, has written called Teaching Naked and the, the strategies therein. And so with that, I would like to turn the time now over to uh, <coughs> President Bone for the presentation. Thanks. You know, the good students always sit in the front. <laughs> so if anybody wants to move from the back to the front, I, I probably not, I, I promise not to spit or, be, or suck. So, um, uh, all right. So this is an interesting room. This is a little old style. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some things you could do if you weren't in a classroom that had fixed tables. Uh, so you'll use your imagination, um, and walls that you could write on, you'll use your imagination. Uh, so we're going to be in here for about an hour. Um, the first part of this is a little bit backwards, just the way the timing worked out today. Um, so I have some new faculty here, so I'm going I'm to take you through um, the design process um, of thinking about uh, your, your new courses, uh, which is actually the subject of the, of the, the, in the Teaching Naked Techniques. I'm going to take you through some of the, the design process for that. Um, and then in the next hour, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the why and where our students are. Um, and uh, both of them are research-based, but they're, this is a more de practical design bit, and the other hour is going to be uh, a little bit more big picture. All right? Um, nobody moved up to the front. I guess I'll have to spit anyway. Um, OK. So um, let's start by taking out a piece of paper. You could use your laptop. Thank you. you could. Um, you could write on the back of one of these handouts a pencil. If you ha remember what those are, you could use one of those. Um, what I'd like you first to do is, is write down what you think the elements of good teaching are. All right. So I'd like you to write down 30 of these in a minute. You're, you do this for a living, remember. This should not be hard. Go. Right? This things that, just make a list, just, just a list. Things that make up good teaching. What are, what are the qualities of good teaching? These are just words. Right. What do you think? Some th some qualities of good teaching. Make a list. All right, that's twenty five seconds, so we should be halfway done. I didn't say they had to be a good list. Just faculty make this mistake more often than students, but it's a common student mistake. Keep going. Twenty five seconds left. See if you can make a list of twenty things. Here's some incentive. For every blank space on your paper, I'll take a finger. <laughs> Please just fill up the page. Go, go, go. Five more seconds. More things, more things, more things. OK, stop. I gave you 15 extra seconds. So anybody get to 20? That shouldn't have been hard. Right, right. If I asked you to list twenty things that are in your refrigerator, right, that should have. Right, you, you're teachers. You do this for a living. You should be able to come up with what are the things that make up good teaching as opposed to bad teaching, right? Part of the problem is, <clears throat> is that you're all faculty. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. You are all good at school, 
So you're all a little bit tentative about making mistakes. So all of you wanted to make good lists. I didn't ask for a good list. I just had a list, right? That's a really common problem. Students get all upset and bothered. Come on, in the front is great. I'm not spitting today. <laughs> and so right, students get all hot and bothered about, wait, I might have a wrong answer. Right? And you're the perfect example of that. None of you wanted to put something that was wrong or stupid on your list. Why not? I didn't say avoid the wrong and the stupid. You could have, right? Um, if you're in the art department, you know this problem, right? Design teachers do this all the time. I have a daughter, and she wants this, you know, in tears. I mean, oh, my kid, he wants, he wants 50 ideas for Monday, 50 ideas for how to sell soap. I said, did he say good ideas? He said, no. I said, he doesn't want 50 good. He wants 50 different ideas. You'll pick one of them will be good. The other 49 will be crap. That's okay. So, so getting used to the idea that you just kind of are in the place, that failure is okay, and I, just, I do that demonstration partly because it's hard, and, and we have a hard time with failure. So if failure is where the learning occurs, how are we going to help our students learn to live with failure if we're so uptight? So relax. Okay. Number two, go back to your list. And what I want you to do is, is actually do this. I want you to try to categorize this. You need a neighbor for this one. Do this with somebody else. So do two or three people, um, or just find a partner. Compare lists, but I want you to organize your list in a concept map, right? It is true that a picture is worth a thousand words, that we do learning, we do learn faster visually than in any other method. Reading turns out to be, by the way, the slowest way that people learn, right? This is measurable. So visual is good. So how do you organize this list into a picture? So do a concept map, right? Good teaching is in the middle. And what are the kinds of things that are on the outside? What is related? Is this related to that? Is that related? So spend a minute, again, not four days. It doesn't have to be perfect. Find a neighbor. Find a partner, make a concept map of good teaching. OK. Let me bring you back in for a minute. Great. All right. So first, let's talk about pedagogy, right? So let's and, and think pedagogy is largely a design problem, right? There's a content piece, right? We're all content experts. But just knowing more isn't, doesn't make you a great teacher, right? Otherwise, Siri would be the best teacher. Right? Knowing more is not what makes you. So it's a design problem. What do we have to do? So ignore the content that I did for a minute. As a teacher, what did I do pedagogically in the first three minutes? What did I do? Yeah. Right. So, but I just, so just what did I do in this room? So, so we started with, right, just like a good video game, do before mastery, right? First, you have to get, do something, get involved, discover I can do this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the room is a little a little stuck, so that I have I have, a, I have a pedagogical challenge. Good. Yes. I asked you to do something that was relatively easy, but also a little bit challenging, right? What we call we call pleasantly frustrating. That's actually where all teaching wants to be. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, so engagement first, right? Some reason to be here in the room. Then also, I had you do something with somebody else, right? Which again, you can do out in cyberspace. But it, but you know, you moved around. You talked to your neighbor. Relationships that Dan Chambliss talked about, right? You actually got the chance to talk to somebody, share ideas. Um, if this room had had a center aisle or a different set, I would have actually had you all do this on the wall someplace or on a white, you know, on some kind of thing that we could share. And then I would now say, OK, so who's got one we can share? And I, either you could project them if you're in a, a certain kinds of classrooms where there's, you know, project from your phone, right? Everybody has a phone. You say, just take a picture and show it up on the screen. Or if we'd written on all the walls, I could say, well, let's look at this one over here. So there are, and that gives, again, somebody a chance to say, well, what? And I can also get a better sense. Right now, I can't. I have no idea what was written in the back row. I can't see them because I can't get there. But if they were all on the wall, we could kind of walk around. I can get a sense. Right, so just so volunteer somebody near the front, maybe. Um, uh, tell me what you have on your list. And give me the, again. What I'm interested in right now are the big categories. So now I'm back to content. What are some of the big categories on your list? Yes. Motivation. What? Motivation. motivation. Good. Good teaching involves motivation. Absolutely. What are what are some of your other categories? What are the? Good. Those are great. What else? Who else has got some other ones? Participation, good. 
Yeah, you gotta have you gotta you gotta have something that you want to teach that, that you have some knowledge. Yeah. Delivery. Delivery. Yeah, I like I like design instead of delivery, but it's the same thing. Yes. Engaging. What else? Relevant. Relevant. Is that related to motivation? So if I was doing it right, you're doing a concept map. So the whole idea of, of the picture is to relate concepts. So I don't mean they're the same, but is relevant related to motivation? And I think the answer is probably, I'm not sure which is the master concept and which is the slave or whatever, I don't, you know, but I mean, they're, they're related concepts. You're gonna get motivation when you're relevant, right? The other reason why I started with what matters to you, that's actually where all teaching starts. What matters to you? So it's gotta be, so relevance and motivation are what matters to you, and then how do I, how do I get you to what matters to me? I don't start with what matters to me, all right? Assessment, we gotta know if you're learning. Feedback, great. Being able to have alternatives for students of different backgrounds, or students who are in different places, different abilities, okay? So motivation and relevance will be different for every student. Yeah, welcome to the challenge, right? Okay, so let's try to move this up. So let's get to the, what is, if I had to only pick two or three categories of the things that have been mentioned, how would I categorize those in the, in the highest sense? What would be the kind of framing term? One might be content. Uh -huh. What else, what would the other one be? Good. So I did this with 40,000 students and I got these two. Right, so when I do this with students, right, and then say, now classify them, and again, classify them, and then classify again, we end up with two sorts of things. It's interesting that content didn't make the list, right? Now content, of course, is a part of design, right, but again, you're gonna to have to learn something, so I guess they're assuming we're gonna learn something. But, but there's, a, there's a design piece, right, and if you ask a little bit further what that means, students will say design, right, fair and organized are the things that matter most. When you go to the classroom, students wanna know, are you organized, are you prepared, and are you fair? So that really matters, fairness really matters at this age group too. And the other is human, right? That, that, that I kind of relate to you, I get you. So yeah, interactive is part of design, but it's also part of human, right? Um, approachable is the big one, right? You don't have to be funny. I mean, if you're funny, great, tell jokes, that's fabulous. But authentic, I would put up there instead of humor in some ways. Students wanna know that you're a real person that you eat food, that you sit on the toilet. They wanna know you're a person, right? So, so show that. We're all, some of us are so concerned about, I gotta be professional, especially as new teachers, right? Prof no, it, yeah, okay, there are some cases where you, know, you have to think about if you look younger than the kids, and yeah, that's, they're sure that those are real issues. But for the most part, they wanna know you're authentic, and they, you have a PhD. This is like, I never heard of that. What do those letters mean? You're like so smart, I can't imagine. You have an office, right? I don't have an office. You know, so they're, you know, they're ready to accept that you're a content expert. Right? They, they accept that pretty easily. What they don't accept is that you're a human being. Right? So you gotta work a little harder if you had to pick one, right? So humor is good if you've got it, but um, if not, be authentic, be yourself. One way to do this, tell stories about yourself, your family, you don't wanna out your kids, say it's about the neighbor's kids. But, but those kinds of real, and especially moments of failure, talking about when it didn't come easily to you especially, because they're gonna assume you were always good at school, they're mostly right. But if when you can say, ah, oh, you know, I really struggled with this. Really? You, the professor, struggled with this? That's motivational in ways that you can't possibly imagine. So these are the two big things that students come up with that matter, and I think the students are mostly right. So, at the end of the day, though, I can give you some tips about being human, but I can't really help you there. <laughs> so I'm gonna focus on the design piece, because I think I can help you there. So there are two handouts. The thick one that has the uh, hexagon on the front is the one we're gonna work through. So what I'm gonna do is go through a design process that's based upon what we now know about how students learn. We now know a lot. So this is a great new book, Make It Stick. If you wanna know a summary of the science of the last 25 years, this is great. I'm gonna summarize it in seven bullet points, right? Concrete and personal, students, people, brains, learn what matters to you, right? Your brain has interesting things that it does to prioritize, 
like it prioritizes the last thing you do before you go to sleep. So if you studied chemistry for three hours, then you get on Facebook for five minutes, what does your brain think is more important? Right? If, if, you do the, if you do Facebook five minutes before you go to sleep, your brain prioritizes Facebook and overwrites all the chemistry and processes Facebook all night long. That's just how you're, right? The last thing you do must be the most important. So we know a lot about how the brain works, but we know especially that what matters to you gets processed more. So that motivation, the relevance, if I can, if I can say this is going to save, you really want to be a doctor, you're going to need to know this. Ooh, I'm going to write that down then, right? I've got it. C content, right? You, you're going to have to have something important to tell them that's clear, but it's not sufficient. Just saying, I have information. It's like, yeah, so does Siri, big deal. Right? So you've got to have information as well. Turns out that testing is essential for learning. We've gotten confused about this in this country because it's the stakes that are the problem. Right? Recall is essential for learning. Remember flashcards? Right? It's, it's the stakes that matter. Video games are good examples of this, right? Because video games are just a series of little micro tests. Right? But if you fail, what happens? You, yeah, see, Every once in a while, an adult will say, you die. It's like, <laughs> every two-year-old knows, no, you don't die. It's virtual. What happens, in, when you, what happens when you fail at a video game? Nothing. You get, to, you get a total clean start over, right? And there are no consequences to failure, which is why they're fun, right? So what we do is we come along and we say, midterm final, 50% of your grade, 30% of your grade, right? All of a sudden, we've added the stakes on it. And now what, ha what happens if I said to you, are you, are you learning how to swim? That's good. OK, and so let's, let's practice. How about the Olympics tomorrow? Is, is that going to improve your swimming performance to go to the Olympics? No, right? Anxiety, pressure tends to decrease performance. So when you make your midterm and final worth 80% of the grade, you've immediately gotten in the way of learning. Now, you do need assessments. But remember that stakes are the problem, not testing. Retrieval is essential for learning. Elaboration is essential for learning, right? Analogies, making connections, connecting knowledge. This is, by the way, at the top of the sheet if you're looking for it. Um, abstracting, equally important for learning, right? Extracting the rules. What, what is it? If I, if it, what is the theory behind this 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 exact example? Failures. We started with failures, essential for learning, right? So. If you're not failing at some point, you're not really going to have that moment. So how do we build that in to our teaching? And then for me, the question is, where do we put it? Where do we put each of these? And then finally, interleaving, which means that and most of us learned in spite of this. Your brain works best when it's not doing the same repetitive task over and over again. So studying chemistry for eight hours at a stretch, writing a paper for eight hours at a stretch, is not the best use of your brain. It's actually better to, after an hour or two, get up, move around, do something else, go play basketball for five minutes, right? talk to the kids, whatever, study another subject. That going back and forth between chemistry and English over four hours is a much better study strategy for your brain. Didn't say it's the only way to learn. And of course, most of you are the exceptions to the rules. right? You're the people who did the PhDs. Right? You were able to stay on task for five years. right? <laughs> most people can't do that. That's why they're not in the room. Right? So you were able to learn that way, but in fact, your brain is actually wired to learn better in varied spaces. So actually sitting in the same place in the library all the time, it's not as good. Okay, I mean, we could measure all this stuff. This is all coming out of cognitive psychology the last 10 years. Um, it's very interesting. So what I've tried to do is to take this and say, how do we turn this into a design practice? Right? How do we take this, this, this research and say, how do I design better environments for learning? So. Um, Turns out that content matters, but content's in the middle, right? We want students to, to join us in this lovely interior of content, right? We live here, we like it, right? So we're going to have course goals. This is good. You start here. Students almost never start there. What's the number one reason students pick a major? Why do they pick a major? Because the teacher in the intro class was funny, right? They, they just like the personality of the person who was teaching the X101. So right, the content's secondary. Right? Dan is right about Dan Chambles is right about that. Students start out here. They start with motivation. Right? They start with motivation exposure. Right? You know what's coming. You know the content. Right? But when I say to you, racial profiling, it's like, what's my first impression? Wagner. Right? What's your first? Right? What's the first thing that comes? That's actually think about all the 
the emotions that are happening in your head. Right? That's part of learning because remember, anxiety reduces performance. So, and that threat response is real, right? Your brain actually works this way. And remember that you have more judgment cells than an 18 year old. Your neocortex is fully developed, hopefully, all of you, right? But until about 25 or 26, your neocortex is still growing, which means it's like trying to teach gymnastics to somebody who grows three inches between every lesson, right? Students are actually <coughs> learning to think <coughs> by growing brain cells. So <coughs> your brain cell sends two signals to your brain for everything, <coughs> right? One goes to, you know, to, the, to the base, your sort of base instincts, you think with your gut kind of thing, and the other goes to the front part of the brain, which is a little bit further away. So if I ask you, should you set your hair on fire? That's not a trick question for you. Most of you have got the answer to that already. I can measure the difference in response time between you and a 24-year-old. They they're still thinking about that, going, cool. <laughs> Wait, that could be, no, no, right? There's a little bit. So the same thing happens with everything that you say. Everything that you say gets filtered for threat response. Everything. So if something you say appears threatening, my amygdala reacts up, the emotions flow. I'm, all, I'm suddenly not in a place where I can learn. So when you say midterm, right? B minus, I see it, right? C in grades. All that stuff sets up a threat response, which, which diminishes your ability to learn. So we've got to start by realizing where our students are. My other favorite analogy, this is, you know, safe spaces, because people, you know, like, oh, you're, you're, just, you're, not, you're, you're coddling them. It's like, wait, when I teach somebody how to swim, what's the first thing I do? Is it? <laughs> is the first thing I do when I teach them to swim, throw them in the water? What's the first thing I should do? Good design practice. Do I have to teach them anything? What's the first thing I do? No, the first thing you do is ask them, how do you feel about water? Because if you're afraid of water, maybe the first thing is not let's go to the water. Maybe the first thing is let's sit over here on the side and talk about water. <laughs> you feel good with water? In you go. But I need to know that. Right? I have to know something about you before I toss you in the deep end. Right? So understanding where your students are starting, and as you said, they're all in different places. So this is also a good thing because the guy online, you're going to find out, you know, doesn't have any of this. Those online people, that, I mean, the, the online free stuff that you get, right, online videos, right? You as a teacher actually have to know your students. There's real value in that. So motivation exposure. Recall, we're going to have lots of recall, but low stakes recall. Elaboration, complication, reflection, right? We're going to do all of these things when we design how this all goes together. So, but we start with content. So I'd like each of you to take a minute and think about a class you're teaching next semester or this semester. What's the hardest thing you have to teach? But by hard, I mean the bit that students scratch their heads about, where they go, ah, I can't do this. This is hard. I don't. What is the thing that you know the students are going to struggle with? And I want you to pick that as your content unit for today that we're going to redesign. And I want you to write a learning outcome to start. So when you write a learning outcome, you're, you're saying, what's the, what's the outcome? What are students going to be able to do? So you've all, I'm, I'm hoping, have learned about bloom levels, right? So we tend to start at the top, right? They got to remember, they got to know, whatever. But most of us really want our students to come down here, right? We want them to actually be able to use the information, analyze, evaluate, be able to do more the complicated higher level things. So spend a minute and write a learning outcome that you're going to work on today. Try to get down here. So it has to have some content so that you know what you're, but so they're, they're going to learn something about this content, but what's the goal? So use the form students will, and if you want, there's probably some on the second page here. If you need a, yeah, those are on the second page. Okay, so everybody has a content area and some sense of where you want your students to go, All right? So when you design a syllabus, I'm not going to talk a lot about syllabus today. When you design a syllabus, you probably just put the topics on it, right? What are we going to cover on Tuesday? The third week we're going to cover this. So one of my suggestions is that you actually don't just put topics, but put learning outcomes. What are we going to do? What are we going to accomplish in week two? What are we going to accomplish in week three, right? But be aware that whatever you put here, students are going to look for a shortcut, right? So what happens if you put week three we are going to talk about feminist theory. 
What happens when it's snowing outside and the students are, are looking to do this, right? Well, the first thing they could do is they could do, they could go to Yale, right? They don't have to, um, they don't have to go to your course, right? They could go to courses at Yale. Um, you teach economics, they have economics at Yale. You teach financial markets, they have that there too. Notice I'm doing this in real time, partly because it's fast. And look, your lecture on whatever, there it is. Good morning. Uh, today I decided not to use PowerPoint, and I'm using index cards. <laughs> this is traditional uh, lecture style. Uh, I what? wanted to talk today about... Oh my uh, God, okay. This is our so third lecture. Most of you recognize this as a traditional, really boring lecture. With index cards. Except that he does have wood paneling. And it says Yale up in the corner, right? So, so students are gonna, are gonna look for this, right? Um, so, but what else? So they might find this and you might be okay with that. Um, or they might go to uh, the Khan Academy, right? This is the number one educational website on the planet. Virtually 100% of your students use this in high school. Anybody have homeschoolers now in your classes? You know why homeschooling has gone up? Thanks to Mr. Khan, because remember the Parents used to be afraid of those two words. Most parents are really afraid of the two words, algebra, homework, right? Oh, Mr. Khan can help you with your algebra, right? I'll make dinner, right? That, that has really changed who helps with the homework. So there are all of these videos, and his has a particular style. If you've not seen one, they look a little bit like this. Um, he, our bodies right. are on the pulmonary system. You never we get left to see him. He's just a alveolar voice. He sacs. On the Let me draw one thing, right here. Right. So so he draws pictures and alveolar sacs that I talked um, about. Notice they all have these captions. Right. You'll notice the videos I'm going to show like today. Right. This. this is another thing that if you make your own videos, so you, you have to worry idea. about this. And if you remember um, from the, the last ADA video, these are kind of where you know. So right. So he does these little videos. There's right. This is 16 minutes long. That's a little bit long. He doesn't actually call them lectures, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, he calls them playlists. Smart man, right? So there's, there's, um, there's iTunes U. Stanford has a massive site, right? Have you been to edX? Has anybody been to, if you've not been to edX, you're gonna be prepared to be depressed, right? So this is this $80 million project from Harvard and, Ye and, and MIT. $80 million? When was the last time you spent $80 million on anything other than a football stadium, sorry. I mean, you probably spent, right? Think about it. I mean, right? Twitter was started with $5 million. And these guys are spending $80 million to develop online courses that are free. And by the way, they're branded Harvard and MIT, right? I mean, the people who are offering content. But notice, notice the kinds of things we have here. Um, we have, you know, you're, you're, of course, you're expecting computer science, but how to write an essay. Um, courses in, you can get, you know, they have master's degree, self-paced. Oh, look, that doesn't look like English. You know, other languages here too. We have courses from universities around the planet. Um, all sorts of things. I figured I was pretty good with jazz improv. You can't teach that online. Berkeley School of Music now teaches jazz improv. It's right. Your course will be here someday because somebody, someplace has the money to do this. So um, there are all sorts of courses available from Harvard for free. Right, I'm in Baltimore. One of my competitors is Johns Hopkins. They've just offered a $400 master's degree in data, data analytics. $400. You have to, the trick is you have to take all the courses online, right, through Coursera and Stanford and Hopkins online. They're in the other, Coursera is the other one, if you don't know about Coursera and edX. $400 for a master's degree? No, that's $400 for a test, right, because they're not giving you any assistance. So if your students can do that, they're going to be fine, right? But they're going to look for content. They're going to look to find stuff online, um, and they're going to they're going to find plenty of it. So you need to kind of be here a little bit first. Um, notice. Um, so let's let's go back to feminists, right? You you've got. Um, so you put uh, you know feminist theory. Um, um, what am I going to find here? So let's do feminist. What did I say? Feminist theory. Right. Well, first of all, most eighteen year olds don't like the word theory because that's too complicated. Explain, right? Um, explain that to me, right? So this is what you would do, right? You'd type it into Google and you'd see what pops up. Are you excited about the results? You're not 18. Look, see this, see this, this, this thing here that says video? That's the button they're gonna hit. Different results, huh? First hit, that's what they're gonna do. But also this thing, search tools over here, have you used that? Search tools on Google? 
Notice any duration, that's what you're using. Sorry, sucker. Short, right? Why would I search all of the internet for stuff when all what I want is a four minute video, right? So let's actually see what the first video is. Let's, this is, here it is. Okay, so, so what is gonna happen next? You know what's gonna happen next. They're gonna come in the class, they're gonna sit in the front, they're gonna go, I know, I know, I watched the video. They're not gonna tell you they watched the video. Right, so you, you spent all of this time crafting a syllabus and you told them it's only, a t I found a 10 page article on this. It'll take you 20 minutes to read. And they're gonna spend an hour looking for a four minute video that they can use instead. That's just how it works. Right, so they're not only gonna watch this, notice the numbers of views here, right? They're gonna, th they don't recognize satire. I'm sorry, but right, look at that. Right? They, this is not satire. They don't, they think this is the right answer. So you have a couple of choices, right? One of your choices would be, don't watch that video, watch this video, right? You could actually point them to a different video and say, here's, this is better content, that's okay. But guess what happens after they graduate? You're not there to do that anymore. They're gonna do this, right? So 48% of freshmen in college in America don't think they have to check stuff they find on the internet. They think that Google is research. Googling, right, they actually think Googling is research. So part of your job is to help them understand how to do this. So here's what I, so, so we're gonna talk about how you can subvert this. So my strategy is gonna be let them find whatever they're gonna find, but make them process is that a reliable, reliable video? How did you know? What were the sources, right? Get them to do what you do, which is to be skeptical of everything they find. That's actually a really important life skill. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your learning outcome, take your topic that you're gonna cover next Wednesday or whatever, and pretend you're 18 years old, which means you're gonna go to Google and you're gonna type in the words that seem to match 19th century poetry, whatever it is that you've put on your learning outcome, and then hit the video button and short, like I showed you, right? I'll go back and do that again, right? And then look for some content, okay? So let's do that. So we'll go back to anything, you know. Um, uh, let's do DNA, that's different. Oh, no, it took me to a website. Let's check, that's how about uh, US politics, all right? So again, not all, but videos and search tools Short. If you don't like it, you could also put U.S. politics like 101. If I right, that's a that's a common trick, right? If you're searching for college information, you, you put you know economics 101, and then you get different. Okay, so whatever whatever your subject is, put it in the search field and see what you find. And go ahead, and make some noise, because I want you to actually find something. If you've got a phone, that's okay. That's what they're primarily using. Just take a minute to kind of see what would a what are your students doing rather than the reading you've assigned them? It's okay, make noise, it's all right. This is, this is. You're really evaluating for a couple of things. You want to know how sexy is this site? How, in, how engaging? Is this gonna, are my students all going to go there or is this like, eh? And then how accurate is the site? And are they going to know that? So let me give you one or two other you should know sites you should know about, and I'll come back. Um, I mentioned edX. This is the one you've really got to look at. So Merlot.org. Um, so if if you want to find good content, right? So yeah, look, bad content's going to be easier to find. Let's be honest. Um, but that means your students are probably going to be there. So the question is, how do you subvert that? That's what I'm going to come back to. But if you want to find something really interesting, Merlot.org is a great place to go to. This is a, a site run by faculty for faculty. So it's free stuff that other faculty, they, you were thinking, I need a US Constitution game. Somebody else has already done it. I need a, wouldn't it be cool if there was a great website that had everything to know about, you know, dinosaurs? There, you know, somebody's probably already done that and they're giving it away for free. Um, so 
Um, for example, so here's, a, here's a, a game. This is one of my jazz games. So this is, again, it's a way to get content to students. Um, so I, what I do is I give students two games at the beginning of the semester for my jazz history course. I say they're each worth 10% of your grade. All right, so there's a little bit of reward here. Um, but you control how many points you get. So there's 10 levels here. Each level's worth a point. Right, you want to get an A on this assignment, you got to get to level 9. You want an A+, plus, get to level 10. You want extra credit, don't bug me, play an extra level. Right, you can do it on your phone, you can do it at home. The grades automatically upload into your LMS. Because they're just levels, right? It's just a math problem. If you're on level 8, that's a B. So I can tell you at the midterm, you should be on levels 5 or 6. You're still on level 5 or 6 by the end of the course. That's why you're behind. So um, I do a couple of these. Uh, so it gives you a thing, and this is actually a higher level so make a hard bop quartet. OK, so I put some drums out here. Uh, and of course, right, there aren't any instructions. Because again, I'm 18. I don't need instructions. I wouldn't read them anyway. I'm going to move my cursor around and go, hey, wait, there's a guy here. Oh, if I click on him, he plays the drums. And how about this guy? Uh, he plays the bass. And then I can do, and she plays, right? So now I've got a little band going, right? Um, so I can add a saxophone, right? And now I've got this. So the question is, is this the kind of band I wanted? Um, well, let's, I can change the drums uh, to something else. The drummer's all moved around. That's fine. Um, all right, so that I'm looking stylistically. It's the saxophone player playing in the right genre with the. All right, so I can check this. How, do I, how am I doing? Oh, God, I've got them all wrong. OK, that's OK. All right. Doesn't matter because I'm just playing. I can, you know, I can try other things. And I could put a different saxophonist in here and see, oh, let's try Charlie. Right? This band never existed. I made it up, right? Because I'm playing all of a sudden. Right? So, so the point is that's a game. Um, there are lots of content games. Kahoot is a great website that does this. Um, where you can you know, put in multiple choice questions that sound like it's just a test. It's not a test when it's on your phone, right? It's a game. And that, that distinction is interesting, right? Because this is just a series of quizzes. Um, but multiple choice quizzes turned into a game like flashcards. There are a couple of programs that do that. Um, students now think it's more fun. They will spend, when I, when I went from drop the needle exams to click on the file exams to what, what's another program that I use, SmashFact, which is like flashcards that you, you know, eight, one, two, three, four, which is the right answer? It's just a test, right? Students quadruple the amount of time on task. There's actually a guy who's gone to his whole course and he's used video game language. So there are no more assignments, there's no more midterms, there's no more finals. They're just quests. <laughs> <laughs> there's a mid quest and a final quest. And there's some optional quests, right? It's just language. So, so gaming, so again, you don't have to invent a video game like this. You can just go on merlot.org. You can find some stuff. Um, you can do some searches. But figure out what content is out there. All right. So part of my point here is that you might be finding bad content. I do not want that. That's great. Thanks very much. But OK, good. Um, so once you have your content, what are you going to do with it? So for example, if you teach Hamlet, remember Hamlet? Remember Cliff Notes? Remember Cliff and his notes? Cliff and his notes have now gone to video. Of course, there are videos about Hamlet, right? So the students are going to watch this instead of read the play. Of course they are. So what do I do? I say, so you know, when you go to the Cliff Notes video, because I know you are, they put little tabs up on the right-hand corner, little yellow tabs that say, here's the themes for each, each bit of the plot. What theme did they forget? Right? What theme did Cliff Notes leave out of Hamlet? What character did they give short shrift to? Right? Or what mistake did they make? Right? OK, so read the Wikipedia entry on Miles Davis. What's the bias of the author? What things are left out? Write three things that you think are not factually correct on an index card and bring them to class. Right? That ability to subvert, to be skeptical, I think is more important than, again, where they get the content. Textbooks are kind of interesting, right? Because textbooks or the last time in your life you're going to get a source that's reliable, right? Think about it. You know, serious, Google is not going to give you only reliable answers. 
right? So textbooks are this kind of weird thing. When you get a job, they don't say, here's the textbook for your job. All the correct information is in here, right? So textbooks are a little bit artificial. They're a little bit strange. So I think letting them out into the mess of the internet, which is where they're going to go anyway, is OK. The trick is, how do we then pull them back so they actually um, are skeptical? And by the way, they're using their smartphone for everything now. So I'm going to assume for the moment that you have some content you want them to learn. And then you've either got a reading or you've got a video. You've got something. I'll come back and talk a little bit more about the types of videos you might find uh, in, in the other session. But you've now got some content that you want them to, to do before class, which is the trick, right? So the question is, how do you get them to do it? And the second trick is, how do you get them to be skeptical and to actually interrogate it? So you have to start with thinking about what matters to your students. And as faculty, we get tripped up here Partly because we were, again, we were good at school. We did the reading. You were the weird ones, right? You did all that stuff, right? So most people don't do that. So you have to start with understanding your students and what matters to them, OK? So notice that it, just the, the directions that I give. If I say to you, read chapter 2, I say to you, find a relative who resembles something in chapter 2. Practice your scales. Find lots of different ways to practice your scales. Go to the museum and look at the artwork. Go to the museum and like get on the floor and learn, look at the artwork from as many different angles as you can. Who simply remembers more in a week? These people in every case. So if your syllabus says chapter two for Wednesday and that's all, you're missing an opportunity. You don't have to put a paragraph. In fact, you probably shouldn't. It should be a Twitter length, right? It should be just a little bit of motivation, right? Um, find something you hate in this article. Uh, what argument is most persuasive? Which character do you like most in chapter three? Some reason to look for something other than just do the reading. Okay, does that make sense? Just, just that's a little tiny adjustment that you can make. But the next thing that you can do is also think about how you characterize what's going to happen. So the first thing that you do when you design and think about a, a unit for your students is not what's the content. I mean, you do. But for them, right, their first, this is their first exposure. So let's think of an example. Um, I call this the entry point. Right? What is people's entry point? And why it matters is because it's the, where you can add value. Right? There are people who know more than you online. Right? There are content experts, and they're free at Harvard. It's, Guys in their underwear in Iowa, right? There's people all over the place who are content experts. You have to know your students. So let's take an imaginary situation. You have to do a six-hour mandatory training on racial profiling for the Salt Lake City Police Department next Saturday. I'm going to pay you a million dollars. I'm going to give you seven PhDs. You've written 100 books on the subject. Is that going to help you? Is that going to help you? Is this going to be successful? Right? You're going to teach racial profiling a group of police officers. You're a content expert. Is that going to help you? What do you need? You need an entry point. You need a way to start the discussion that's motivating. Because right, it's like going to driver training school when you've got a ticket or something. Right, You just don't want to be there. Okay, So where do you start? So some ideas. Because I'm not going to start by going, hi, welcome to the six hour mandatory training by the state on racial profiling. I'm the expert. You are not. It's not a good place to start. right? So where would you start? What could we talk about? Remember what I did when I first got here? Remember, we're trying to lower stress. How do I lower the stress in the room and get people excited about the six hours to come? That's the design problem. That's why we pay you the big bucks. So some ideas. How do I start? Yeah. OK. Ask people a question. That's a good way to start. Yes? Great. Have some jokes about it. That's uh, that's good, good, good way to lower stress. Good. Or have them tell you some jokes. Yes. Okay. What else? Keep going. You got to back it up a little further. They're probably going to see through your jokes. They're probably going to know something's coming. Yeah. Telling people why they're going to study or why this is going to be valuable is actually a very important, that's a generally good technique. 
This is why this is going to be useful. The problem is I need to know why, what you want to do with it. So if I say, this is going to be really useful when you become a doctor, but I don't want to become a doctor, right? This is going to be really useful to you when you, uh, I don't want to, right? So you've got to actually understand a little bit first about your students, but you're right. Actually, the more transparent, the more you explain, the better. Yeah. So get to know what is it that you really want to accomplish? What are you trying to do? And then how, maybe I can find a way to help you accomplish that. Absolutely, that's a great, those are all excellent suggestions, all right? So I'm going to take it back one step further, right? What I, what I really want is engagement first, right? Engagement before performance. I want to lower anxiety and get people excited and engaged and motivated. So entry points, it turns out actually not to matter what the topic is going to be. Doesn't matter. So Wagner, right, one of my subjects. So I used to write Gesamtkunstwerk on the chalkboard and underline it. Really important concept in Wagner. Are you excited? Are you motivated? Or you just want to run? Right? We're going to talk about Wagner's Ring. I teach a whole course on Wagner's Ring. 17 hours of opera in German. It's the world's longest piece of music. Are you ready? Probably not going to help. So where do I start? Anybody here like music? Anybody here like music with lyrics? Let's talk. Can, who, give me a song that you like and tell me why. How do the music and the lyrics relate? And then we talk about that for 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Why? Because it's exciting to you, right? You like music. You like lyrics. Let's talk about, right. And then at some point, somebody will say, well, you know, I kind of like this song because the lyrics are like saying, she loves you, she loves you, and the music is going, you know, not so much. See, really? How does that work? And then at some point, you know, that, so I have to wait for that moment, right? But when that moment comes, I'm ready. Well, you know, there's this dead white guy. And he had a theory about that the, the, the words speak to your head and the music speaks to your heart. What do you think about that? Does that sound like? I don't have to mention Wagner, right? I didn't mention Wagner, just some, just some, some dead guy. And he had this, you know, it's an interesting idea, right? So can you think of a song that works that way? Right? A song that you like? Because so now we're talking about things that you like about it. And then eventually, I will say, well, you know, let's, we're going to read some of this theory because it's kind of a lot of music works this way. And then we're going to try to apply it. He actually wrote some music that kind of works that right? Pedagogy starts with what matters to your students. It ends with what matters to you. It doesn't start with what matters to you. So let's go back to racial profiling. So now, how are you going to have, where's a place that I can start with police officers? It doesn't have to actually involve race at all. Anybody here, like, anybody here drive a truck? Anybody here drive a truck? What kind of truck? Anybody, anybody drive a Ford? Dodge? We all drive Chevys? Okay. So this is not the, the Salt Lake City Police Force, right? So I have two brothers in law who are both truck drivers, right? They both, right? But, but man, you could not, ex could I give you a Ford instead? See, why not? Right, so, so let's have a conversation about trucks or about Ford versus Chevy or Dodge or something, right? And just, right, and then let, let people get heated a little bit. You gotta wait for that moment. So, so what has happened? Why, why, are, why does it matter which, whether it's a Chevy or a Dodge? Oh, because you have a preference, like a bias, maybe? So biases operate in all of our lives all the time. What's the advantage of the bias? What's the disadvantage of the bias? And if it works in trucks, might it work someplace else, right? But notice I didn't start with racial profiling, right? I started with, with something else. And you get people engaged with on that topic, and then, right? So you've got to know your audience. You've got to understand what matters to them. But you've also got to find a way to get them going and excited, and then you bring them in. Does that make sense? That's an entry point. Now I want you to write one for your subject. So remember, before you assign the reading or the video or whatever it is you're going to assign them, you've got to get their interest. So what's the entry point for your subject that's on your piece of paper? So let's write an entry point. What are they going to do, think about, write, write? What are they going to? No. Think about a food that you hate. Think about a relative you hate. Right? Think about your favorite piece of furniture in the library. I mean, something, right? Something that's non-threatening, that's just kind of interesting and bizarre. But so write an entry point. Yeah. So give us give us your topic and then how you introduce the topic. Yes, please. Uh, I teach technical communication for engineers, so... Are we all excited? Technical communication for engineers? You're all going to sign up for that right away, right? That's good. <laughs> um, the big project students do in my class is to write a proposal. So my entry point... Get nervous uh, already. I know. Yeah. Like so much Engineering? Fun. I have to write? I thought it was going to be an engineer. 
Exactly. So my entry point when we start talking about proposals is, let's talk about killer whales. And? Because uh, we talk about killer whales in the sense that there was a big accident at SeaWorld and SeaWorld put out a big RFP to find a way to get the weight of five killer whales and a trainer off the bottom of the holding pool in 30 seconds or less. Then we examine the RFP. Okay, so there's an example of writing. Good, and that's gonna lead to work. And, and so the thing that you probably want is the work, the problem. So again, so don't, don't forget that, but the motivation. Think about what is it the thing that they want? And again, engineers and well, people want different things. Right, so what they want is they want the work. They want to solve the problem. So how do you how do you use that? Good. Who else has got one? It's not that scary. But notice that when you hear somebody else's example, you start to go, "Ooh, okay, I'm scared of that." Right? Because you have some of the same. Because you don't. Have, you're not scared of this because you teach it. But everybody else in the room is like, "Oh, uh, right. I don't want to do that." So okay, give me another one. It's a topic. We'll help you. It's okay. Yes. I teach anatomy and physiology. Another fantastic subject. I have thought about the, process, the physiological processes of the kidney. Students will be able to understand. Man, I love the kidney. <laughs> well, question I have though is what's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Good. <laughs> okay. So I know the answer. So then what do I then what happens? Where does it go? I mean, where did it come from? Okay. Why is it there? Makes sense? That's good. All right, so that's so so we don't start with so and so and if you put kidneys on Tuesday on your website, they'll just go find a video on kidneys, right? And so, um, you know, what do you do in the morning is a different place. So now notice this, this, you gotta you gotta lay the breadcrumbs from A to B sometimes, right? So these are good ideas. So you know, you, you need to think a bit about I didn't give you a whole lot of time, but think a bit more about how do I get them from A to B. Um I again you know, I teach, you know, 19th century heavy text. So Wittgenstein is another great text, right? Students are like, I don't really want to read Wittgenstein. Okay. So so I don't serve Wittgenstein. So here's a picture of my family. We're gonna talk about family resemblance. It's a concept by some dead white guy. Right? Don't, don't worry about him for a minute. But so can you notice that the, some kids share my nose and other kids have my ears and the, some, they don't all share the same things, but my wife's hair color appears on this tip, right? And so we do this whole exercise. Got it, got it, great. So okay, so that's called family resemblance. You can see it can be useful for some kinds of concepts like games or other kinds of, right? It might be useful. So we're gonna read it about it for next Wednesday, okay? Everybody got it, great. Okay, so I'll see you Wednesday. Oh, uh, by the way, all my kids were adopted. Thanks. <laughs> Wait, but I, so what's the problem with, right? I mean, the point is I left them with a problem they want to solve. So then that, now they have to go do that. So you can do this in class. You can do it on email. You can do it by text. But their moti the, don't ignore the motivations for why you should do the reading, why you should watch, why you should learn the content. You're going to need to do that all the time. One other trick. Turns out that your instructions for problem sets and reading, all that stuff also matters. If I say to you, can you make a nasal contraceptive? Yes or no? Who says yes? Who says no? Well, first of all, it's not a very good question, right? Because you're all having to make a binary choice, right? So that's not good. Here's a better question. How would you make a nasal contraceptive? Right? I just, I just opened the door of possibility, haven't I? How would you make a nasal, what would have to happen for a nasal contraceptive to work, right? You see how the brain is now working in different ways? You're now thinking, well, this would have to happen, then that would have to happen, right? The answer is yes, by the way, you can do this, right? Um, so, but that's, again, the way that you phrase the questions in the problem set, the way that you think about why you're gonna, all of that stuff turns out to actually matter. If you tell students, this is the way it is, and you know you're simplifying, you're doing a real disservice. Remember that students will eventually probably have to complicate what you're doing. So if you use the words usually, normally, most of the time, for today, when I simplify, it actually makes a cognitive difference in what happens later. Um, we actually think a lot of the difference between boys and girls in mathematics through K through 12 has to do with who takes the directions more seriously in second grade. It turns out to have an effect you know, four years later. If you've learned that this is the, two plus two always equals four, and these are real numbers. And these are, now we're gonna talk about some irrational numbers. Wait, you didn't say that was a possibility in second grade. Well, you don't actually have to say that's a possibility, but you have to say normally, usually. But though, again, your, your instructions, the way that you talk about your subject, if 
you say always in a bull market, if you write down always, right? Normally, usually. Textbooks, it actually makes a difference too when you put this in the textbooks. So if you can problematize and make questions in the way that you talk about your subject and about what you're going to do in the problem set, that helps. Does that make sense? So you have your content, but you've also got to have an entry point. What's the motivator? How are you going to know about this? All right? So then, so, you've, so you, right, you want to get them in here. So after, they, after you give them the reading or the video to watch, you need to have them recall. So I'm going to suggest that you do an online exam before every class. Low stakes, right? Because it, it's not the exam, it's the problem. It's the midterm is worth half your grade. Look, so every day you've got a 1% five question exam to do before you come to class. Use Bloom levels, and I use these kinds of questions. So why do I use multiple choice questions? Because if you have 500 students in your class, you don't want to grade all, right? And you want to reuse them from year to year. So it's not the best learning tool, but it's only only worth a percent, right? They're, they're low stakes assessment, and you're going to learn something. So analysis level, why did I put analysis level here? Why did I tell the students what level of Bloom the question was? It's transparent, and it's motivational. Two things we know work with students. So tell them. I'm, it's not just a recall, it's an analysis question. The following are all true statements. Why would I do that on a multiple choice question? Why would I tell you the following are all true statements? Remember, you're at home. I'm not, you're not in class. You're on your phone. So I don't want you asking Siri, because Siri's really good at finding true statements, right? Siri's re relatively good, right? So I don't want you just Googling the answer. So I'm going to tell you they're all true. What I want to know is which are fact, opinion, or judgment? Which are most relevant? Siri sucks at this, right? What are the most relevant statements about diagnosing the patient with this? What are the most important things the kidney does? Right? What are the least important things the kidney does? Right? Um, so again, I might give you the same list of answers. So the following are all true statements about the kidney. Which are the most relevant in understanding who could be a good donor? Or some, right, some other kind of question. Which are the most relevant arguing against that? Um, check all that apply. Why do I do partial credit? Lowers the stakes. Anything you can do to lower the stakes increases performance. Make it less, less about the grade, more about the performance. All right, so a couple of examples. Following are all true statements. Um, this I got from one of these workshops. Um, which are the most likely to be used by Democrats to support government policy? Government spending creates jobs. Tax cuts create jobs. They're both true, by the way. Which are most likely to be used by Republicans? To, right, I have, so I have two questions up here. Right? I asked them one question and the other question with the same list of answers. And I'm asking which are most likely to be used, not which are true, Right, which is the emphasis from one party or the other. This messes with their head. But wait, I thought my side was telling the truth and your side was lying. My parents told me that the other side is always just lying, right? The idea that there's actually two sides and there might be some controversy about which evidence you use, and this is true for all of your fields, not just politics or economics, right? That there are controversies. There are things we're not entirely sure of and the preponderance of evidence, that kind of thing, right? So, this is going to get your students to recall in a different kind of way than just what's in the book on page 42. Right? What was in the book that might be relevant? Here's another one. This is from my arts entrepreneurship course. Um, this is from the unit we do on contracts. So yes, I teach contract law to ceramicists and dancers and oboists. This is like your communications course for engineers, right? They're not very happy about being in this class, right? So, why would you need a contract to sell your artwork? The following are all true statements. They're all true about contracts. But which are the, re the best reasons to actually do a contract? What do we think about A? Is A a good answer? What do we think? Yes? How about B? What happens if you're late for somebody's wedding and you're the band? Do, they, do you have to get, do you get paid? Could they sue you for ruining their wedding and ask for you to pay for a new wedding? Yes. So you want to limit your liability. So B is a great answer. How about C? This is true, right? Is it a good reason to do a contract? So are these opinions? Or are they judgments? Right? They, they involve some thought. They're not just, I like ice cream. 
These are judgments. So again, I want to move students into this area. This is actually where most of the fun happens in your brain. It's not the memorization of facts or the having opinions, right, which is what Will Perry called that the kind of the sophomore junior stage of college. Right, the, but it's my opinion. Why didn't you like it? It's like, because it's not about your opinion. It's about the way you argued for it. And you didn't, you only gave me opinions, not judgments, right? So D is, how about, uh, how about F? You've just sold a two ton sculpture. Did you include shipping? Contract helps you do this. How about G? Is G a good reason to do a contract? We like G, yes. How about H? So, right, they're not opinions, right? So, so students do five or six of these before every class, after every reading, after right, or every contact unit. What, what now happens? First of all, you've got to write some good questions. This will take you some time. But it means they come to class prepared because they've had to do a little bit of work at home. All right? So um, I won't have you do a question now. So you've got the motivated. You've given them a little low-stakes recall. Now the question is, why would they come to class? This is really important, right? Because a lot of the world is online. You could, there's a lot of easy shortcuts you can make. Why would they actually come to class, right? So give them assignments that they do at home, right? The homework. The trick for homework is, is the homework needed for class? So what I would do is give them shorter homework assignments, but more relevant homework assignments. Homework assignments that then become useful in class. So instead of giving them all the problems to do at home, Give them the seven easy problems to do at home and, and give the three hard ones in class. So actually spend some time doing in class. That also moves the failure into the, into the space here where I can help you. Failure at home is really disproportionately a disadvantage to first generation kids who don't have a parent at home who went to college. You can help them with their calculus or whatever, right? So prepare an assignment, do a whatever, and you come to class. And then I complicate things in class because I want to complicate things, but I want to do that here. So OK, hey, the meeting has been moved from New York to Tokyo. You've got 10 minutes in your computer. Figure out what changes. Maybe nothing changes, right? Um, I gave you some flawed data. I'm so sorry. The product actually just failed a test. That never happens in the real world, of course. But it just happened here. Go online. There's a new database. What else can you do? Um, one of the ones that I do is I have students do a product list for their, you're a, you're a, you're a painter. What could you sell pictures of? What could you do? Could you do dog portraits? Right? Make a list, and then you bring them to class. So you bring your list to class that you've had to do at home. Now, how do you price your dog portrait? How much do you charge for a dog portrait? I don't know. You have an internet. Pretend you want to buy one. You get five minutes. Go. So they're immediately doing something on their computer in class, and then what do I do? Now, please close your laptop. Right? You have to, those are the magic words. But in order to say, please close your laptop, you probably have to say, please open your laptop every once in a while. Otherwise, they just think you have three heads. Right, so I let you do some research in real time. Then, I, then you close. Now I want you to sell stuff to everybody in class. <coughs> right, sell your dog portraits. Everybody, I'm giving everybody five thousand dollars. Now go sell and buy dog portraits or whatever you're going to do. And then the class erupts and people do stuff. And I give you ten minutes. Okay, back to your. What did we learn? Right. So you had to do the homework to be able to do the class exercise. Does that make sense? And then you're also going to surprise them. Um, so some things you can do. Practice well, obviously problem sets. Writing is key. So I have them write before every class, every class. Index cards, save your life. Low tech, index cards, it's short. It's also, you can use them to take attendance. You read the article. What quote really exemplified your favorite character? What did you like least about the chapter? What was the bias in the chapter? What was the mistake in the chapter? What did you not like about, right? Some kind of analysis skepticism on an index card. One index card, one paragraph, three sentences. Then come to class, pass it to your neighbor, who turns it over, writes a rebuttal. Because guess what happens? If you know somebody else is going to read your writing, guess what you do? You edit it a little bit more. And do you edit more for me or for your neighbor? You actually don't care what I think about your writing. But you really care if your roommate thinks you're dumb. So that students will actually edit more if they know they're going to have their roommate read their writing. I don't make this shit up, right? I just, right? So, but I have them write to, again, elaborate, think about it. Can you find another example of that theory? Write down a, on an index card three or four sentences, an elaboration. What would happen if this experiment were happening on Mars? Just write, think, elaboration, other kinds of thoughts. Writing for every class. 
prepare for something. I gave an example of that. Make a list. Find something. You know, make, take, use your phone. Take three pictures of a ba bad intersections in town and post them on this, you know, Twitter feed or Snapchat or something. Right? Analyze something. Uh, bring it to class. Paste. Right? All kinds of things you can do. Then when you come to class, there's a surprise. They know there's going to be a surprise in my class. They just don't know what it's going to be. So yes, they spend hours trying to figure out what it's going to be. And I asked kids who were in the class last year, it's like, it's going to be a different surprise this year. Right? So they come to class to find out what the surprise is. But somehow I'm going to, I'm going to make it more like the real world. Right? So, we've been you, so you did a reading. You talked about people's kidneys. Those were normal kidneys. The kidneys we're going to talk about today, the, they, have a diff they have a problem because right, something happened. And so normal function has been altered. How do you fix it? So it's, it's not what you were expecting. And then next year, you have to have a different surprise. That's your fun, that's your first one. That's a freebie, right? Can you reframe the problem? Can you use your index cards to start a discussion? Right? So there are lots of things you can do in class. But my point is that you have to think about each of those pieces. All right? Um, last thing, and then, I'll, and then I'll stop and we'll pee. Because our kidneys need it, right? Um, <laughs> reflection, right? So the, the, if you really want to turn your students into self-regulated learners, right, where they're learning, when they graduate, they're going to learn new stuff, right? You have to give them an opportunity to reflect on how they prepared, how they learned. So I call this a cognitive wrapper. I do not grade them. There's a, there's a template at teachingnaked.com if you want it. Don't use the whole thing. You've got to reduce it to a page, all right? So when I give you back your paper, problem set, whatever it is, if you learn nothing else today, never put a grade on anything. That's what computers are for. You have Canvas, has a grade book. Put the grades there. Put feedback on the paper. Put feedback on the test. Then hand them back in class and say, look at the feedback. Read the feedback, right? Because you know the problem. What's the problem? They see the grade. Ah, 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 B minus, B minus, my parents are going to kill me. They don't read your feedback because they're worried about the beating they're going to get. So they stuff it in their backpack and they never look at it. And you spent 20 minutes writing feedback. Wasted. So if you're going to write feedback, don't put the grade on the paper. Put the grade on Canvas. I'll reveal the grades in an hour because it'll let your Canvas will let you hide the grades. So your grades for your midterm or your test are online, but they're hidden, so don't go look. Wait. Wait. Read the feedback. Read the comments on your paper without knowing what the grade is, and then answer three simple questions that will not be graded. Here's a piece of paper. Don't put your name on it. Don't, right? Just, this is for you to process. This is the yoga bit of class, right? Reflection. How did you prepare? Did I study alone with a friend? Did I redo the reading? What did I do? Estimate, because you don't know, where do you think you lost points? What do you think your grade is going to be and why? And then what would you do differently next time? Now students are going to wait. So you said my thesis was lame. You made a lot of comments about my thesis. So maybe I, wait, thinking is important? It says that this is, because you, you, you can lead them along the way. Thinking matters? Reading? Researching? I didn't know that, right? So it's a way to give, and I don't grade them. I let students process this on their own. I can collect them and give them back. Or I just, you know, I'm going to let students just hang on to this the next time we have a midterm, next time we have a test, next time we have a paper. So you can reflect on this. So this is the cycle. Right? So, so my point is that I don't think you can design a good lesson without doing all of this. So that's work. You don't have to actually do each piece every time, but it works better if you do. So what you need is a design process, a way of thinking about what are the pieces of the pile. Like if you're going to teach anything, if I'm going to teach how to do a good RFP for an engineering project, right? There are, there's a structure. Well, it's got to have some outcomes. It's got to have, right? There, there are some bits that I know I need to do. So as a teacher, what's the design process? What are the pieces that I need? And those are the pieces that's, again, it's based directly on the research of how the brain works. So I've given you some ideas. But the idea is that you have to have some kind of process. It's not just here's some content, right? Absorb, right? It's, it's about how do I get you motivated, give you some opportunities for recall, give you a chance to elaborate, complicate in class, a chance to reflect and think about your own performance. That's like a three-hour workshop in an hour. I'm sorry, but here we are. Questions before we 
Believe our kidneys? You're all doing this already, right? I'm sorry. Yes, questions are good. Yeah, so, so syllabus can be a contract. That, that's actually not a bad idea. I mean, so for example, think about this at the beginning of the cycle. So you start to say, okay, so everybody in my class, first day of class, write down on a piece of paper what grade you want in my class. Okay. Now, what do you think you have to do to get that grade? And I don't, right? What behaviors will you need to do? And hold on to this piece of paper, because in three weeks I'm going to come back and say, so did you actually study four hours a day? So don't be surprised you didn't get, right? But let the students determine what they have to do to get that grade. And then if you hold them to the behaviors, it's probably going to work. Right? Because if they're not studying four hours a day, they're not going to get the A that they wanted to get. And you'll be amazed. Some students will say they just want a B plus. It's kind of interesting. It's like, so you know, I want a B plus, and so here's, I'll, I'll show up. Okay, you can get that B plus. Only, you know what, it's really going to be a D plus, but right? <laughs> All right, one more, yeah. So on the one hand, you know, the brain works the same way for everybody. Those, all those older students have more judgment cells, so that's good. They'll be motivated by different things. So you, you, know, you have to alter. The hardest part of this is that you have students of all different levels of motivation in your class, and they're motivated by different things. So nothing works for everybody, even if they're all the same 18-year-old that came from the same high school. right? So you've always, you're always going to teach to the middle a little bit, and you're going to make what, what's going to work for most people Pull, pull a student aside and say, how can I help you with this? How can I, you know, you're, you're going to have to do some of that. So, but you're going to increase your odds if you at least start by understanding where is the class as a group? Is this class really interested in football? Is it really interested in fitness or Chinese food? You know, what, does the class share something? And also, you know, here you, you're, in a, you're in a particular geography, right? The guy at, at, at Yale isn't in your geography. He's just teaching to the world. You know, you know there was just a snowstorm last week. Well, how much snow do we think fell? Suppose the snow had this, right? I mean, you, you, can, you can come up with specific problems that relate to your geography and your culture and your environment. It won't work for everybody because you've got the one kid who's just arrived in Utah from Florida or whatever. But, but you're going to get more people by talking about the things that are mattering to most students. All right, let's take a break, and we'll come back at 3.30 and finish off.